Amy Winehouse was one of the most notable musicians of her day. Sadly, however, she was also notorious for her turbulent private life. From her early troubles to her untimely passing, this is the tragic real-life story of Amy Winehouse. Amy Winehouse began to show talent from a very young age. Unfortunately, she also began to show the first signs of the various troubles that would plague her adult life. Winehouse was born in 1983 to cab driver Mitch Winehouse and pharmacist Janice Winehouse. Her childhood was full of music, since so many members of her family were jazz musicians. She was exposed to a whole range of different musical styles, and by the time she was 10, she was even part of a salt and pepper influenced rap band called Sweet and Sour. In 1996, a 12-year-old Winehouse managed to get a place at the prestigious Sylvia Young Theater School, but she was kicked out at just 16. It appears that her rebellious streak may have been raising its head by this point, as the reason for her expulsion was that the young Winehouse was failing to apply herself in her studies. It didn't help that she had dared to pierce her nose, too. Not exactly the most devastating acts of disobedience, sure, but things weren't going to get smoother from there. Winehouse was a huge fan of body ink, and one of her most prominent tattoos was an arm piece picturing a crude pinup girl surrounded with hearts and the name Cynthia. But this wasn't just some random walk-in piece. It was a special tribute to Winehouse's grandmother, Cynthia, and she designed it in collaboration with tattoo artist Henry Haight, who made the deliberately crude piece with little idea that it would go on to become one of the most recognizable tattoo designs in the world. Haight gets the occasional request to tattoo the same design on other people, but he always refuses out of respect to Winehouse and the tattoo's original meaning. Winehouse was extremely close with her grandmother, who was also a singer and was highly supportive of her granddaughter's artistic aspirations. Winehouse's first manager, Nick Shymansky, even considered Cynthia to be the singer's guardian, and both he and Winehouse's father believed that Cynthia's death was the event that triggered the artist's downward spiral. During the mid-2000s, Winehouse had a famous and famously turbulent love affair with Blake Fielder Civil. They started dating in 2005, which also marked the start of Winehouse's shift in appearance. From the comparatively conventional look of her jazzy Frank era to her famous tattoos, winged eyeliner, and beehive hairdo, Fielder Civil has fully admitted that he was the one who introduced the singer to heroin, crack cocaine, and self-harming. And although he said he felt more than guilty about it, it didn't make the pair's relationship any less difficult. They broke up, got together, and broke up again. They got married and had a divorce. At least once, they fought so badly that they were reportedly covered with blood and bruises. Oh, and by the time Winehouse had made her breakthrough and risen to the top of the music industry, Fielder Civil was in prison for assault. When she died in 2011, he was in prison again, this time for attempted robbery and possession of a fake gun. Yet, despite the many, many red flags, Winehouse always seemed to consider Fielder Civil as something of a muse. Even during his worst troubles, she showed public support for him several times, and she famously boasted a tattoo of his name close to her heart. Winehouse's substance abuse started to spiral out of control around the time her grandmother became deathly ill in early 2005. What's more, the bulimia she quietly struggled with as a teen made a comeback, and her rocky relationship with Blake Fielder Civil wasn't helping things either. Eventually, things became so bad that her manager Nick Shymansky tried his best to convince Winehouse to go to rehab and sort things out. She was fine with the idea and everything was in order, but she wanted her father to back up her attempt to get sober. Mitch Winehouse promised Shymansky to tell his daughter that the rehab plan was a good idea. But just as happens in the lyrics to her iconic song, Rehab, Mitch told his daughter that she didn't need to go after all. My dad did actually go, you're all right, I need to go. So I said, all right, dad, I'll go and meet him and then we'll back out, which I did. She didn't need to go to rehab. This incident has widely been described as Winehouse's last chance at tackling her issues, before becoming a sought-after superstar made it doubly more difficult. And while she did eventually give rehab a shot in 2008, by then it was far too late. Amy Winehouse did more than her share of walking on the wild side, so it's not exactly a shock that she had a few run-ins with the police over the years. A lot of this unwelcome attention from the law seems to have coincided with the turbulent years after Back to Black propelled her to superstardom. Tragically, it also seems to be in connection with her issues with substance abuse. In 2007, Winehouse was arrested in Norway and spent the night in custody for cannabis possession. This wasn't her only arrest that year, however, as she was also briefly arrested due to an unspecified case involving her husband, Blake Fielder Civil. Winehouse's troubles with the law continued in 2008 when she was arrested for allegedly assaulting someone outside a bar in London. There was another assault allegation against her that year, along with an incident that saw her arrested for alleged drug offenses. That wasn't the end of it either. In 2009, the singer ended up in court for allegedly punching a dancer in the eye at the backstage of a summer ball, after said dancer had asked for a selfie with her, 
Later that year, Winehouse attacked a theater owner who was trying to stop her from making a scene at a performance of Cinderella. Everyone who's even passingly familiar with Amy Winehouse's story knows about her long-running struggles with addiction. After she gained recognition in the British media, she began to drink heavily, possibly as a way of dealing with the pressures of fame. But I don't think I'm going to be at all famous. I don't think I could handle it. Things only became worse after Blake Fielder Civil introduced her to hard drugs. By 2009, Winehouse's addictions had started to severely affect both her voice and her career, and she was notorious for appearing on stage visibly drunk. The crowd started booing her and concerts were canceled, and although Winehouse's representatives attributed these bumps in the road to health issues, her troubles with alcohol were obvious to pretty much everyone. Unfortunately, she was unable to correct the course. It was alcohol that ultimately killed her in 2011 at just 27 years old. On paper, Amy Winehouse's tragic tale of fame, addiction, death seems like a fairly straightforward story, but there might be more to the tale than that. Asif Kapadia, the director of the Oscar-winning documentary Amy, believes that the artist may have suffered from brain damage that, as he put it, prevented her from thinking straight. Kapadia bases his theory on a claim that Winehouse had a number of overdoses and seizures during her years of substance abuse, but he's not the first person to speculate on the potential damage to the singer's brain. In 2008, the press reported that medical professionals had warned Winehouse that another drug binge might actually kill her, and that several doctors were genuinely concerned that the vast amount of drugs she was taking could leave her with brain damage. It's hard to know how accurate this is, however, considering the way the media treated her at the time. It's probably fair to say that at some point in their careers, most British celebrities have had to struggle with unwanted attention from the country's tabloids. However, Amy Winehouse had to play the press game on hard mode. Much of this was because the media field was shifting at the time. As a troubled famous person prone to the occasional public meltdown in an era before YouTube and Facebook had gotten big, she was in the worst possible place at the worst possible time when it came to unwanted media attention. People can never get enough of celebrities with difficulties, and Winehouse pretty much led that twisted voyeurism into the digital age. Because her face attached to a cover story was basically a license to print money, she was constantly hounded by the paparazzi. Asif Kapadia, director of the documentary Amy, says that the singer was essentially trapped in a situation where almost everybody close to her had a media deal of some sort, leaving everyone looking out for their own interests, and she herself getting more and more lost in the middle of it all. Often, artists can seem completely doomed with their careers all but dead in the water, and then they unexpectedly get their act together to re-emerge in a glorious comeback that sets them back on the right path. Unfortunately, not everyone can pull this off, because it requires the artist to have actually spent some time wrestling their demons into submission. Amy Winehouse certainly hadn't accomplished this when she embarked on her comeback tour in 2011. Winehouse had largely avoided the stage for the previous two years, so her European tour had all the markings of a grand comeback. But when she entered the stage in Belgrade, Serbia, it was evident this comeback was going to be anything but glorious. It was, however, a painful demonstration that her addiction issues were far from behind her. Winehouse randomly stopped a song halfway through to introduce the band, only to barely remember their names. She suddenly made a freaked-out backup dancer take over the vocals on Valerie. At one point, she decided to take off a shoe. All in all, the media considered the concert the worst in Belgrade's history, and even the country's Minister of Defense called it, in his words, a huge shame and a disappointment. The rest of the tour was promptly canceled. We're going to turn now to a major loss in the music world tonight. The gifted singer Amy Winehouse found dead in her London home. She was just 27. After years of excruciating public struggles with drugs, alcohol, and the law, Amy Winehouse's life came to an end on July 23, 2011. Winehouse was only 27 years old when she died, and her cause of death was ruled as accidental alcohol poisoning. Before her death, she had developed a pattern in which she stayed sober for weeks before falling off the wagon with a drinking binge. Eventually, her body just couldn't take anymore. Winehouse was found lifeless in her room the next morning with a staggering blood alcohol level of 0.416 at the time of her death. Of course, it's worth pointing out that Winehouse's death almost certainly was accidental. Shortly before her death, Winehouse had specifically told doctors that she didn't wish to die and that she was looking forward to her future. By all accounts, the death of Amy Winehouse really was a tragic mistake. In 2013, Winehouse's brother Alex Winehouse put forward an alternate theory for the cause of her death. He doesn't exactly contest the coroner's ruling of death by misadventure, and he fully admits that his famous sister's vast drug and alcohol levels did no favors to her health. However, Alex feels that it wasn't narcotics that most contributed to his sister's untimely passing, but an eating disorder. 
Winehouse had struggled with bulimia for years, and her brother feels that her physique was significantly weakened by periods of extreme overeating and the bouts of vomiting and depression that typically follow. Alex Winehouse says that the condition stemmed from the singer's teenage years, when she had a group of friends who would eat and throw up food together. He says that most of them eventually stopped, but the condition stuck with his sister, and since she wasn't prepared to really talk about it, her eating disorder was a difficult issue to bring up. Still, Alex decided to breach the subject after his sister's death in order to raise awareness for the condition. Today, he co-runs the Amy Winehouse Foundation in his sister's name.